Greeting once again, ladies and gentlemen, Laszlo Montgomery here, back again with a whole new topic. Hope you don't mind, the past several topics have all been listener requests. Hey, that's where I get my best material. Back in 2010, when I began writing down topics to present for my new podcast show, Homer Lee made it to the original list. For some reason, despite being requested so many times by listeners, I haven't gotten around to him till now. I don't know how to begin to introduce Homer Lee. Only a little less than half of you live in the United States, according to my stats, that is. So I often wonder if anyone who isn't American finds these stories interesting about all these incidental foreigners who got to hop onto the stage of Chinese history and seize the day to get their cameo or 15 minutes of fame. I think all CHP listeners from all nations have their own homegrown Homer Lees who got to witness or take part in the many exciting and historic events in late Qing, early Republican period in China. I have to say, in presenting Homer Lee's life, I can't help but notice so many parallels between his story and someone else I covered years ago in a two-part series on the life of Morris, Moisha, Tugun Cohen. Both of their lives had absolutely no impact on the direction or the events that shaped Chinese history during the final years of the Qing dynasty, or in Morris Cohen's case, the Republic of China. But there they both were, serving Sun Yat-sen and his revolutionary ideas, albeit at different times, and both could never stop dreaming their oversized China dreams. Homer Lee was born November 17th during the American centennial year of 1876. Ulysses Grant was president. Chinese exclusion was still six years away. The Guangxu emperor was three months into his reign as the Qing dynasty's penultimate emperor. His mother was younger sister to the empress dowager Cixi. The Guangxu emperor never knew it, but Homer Lee dedicated a good part of his life to him. Anyway, before we get to that, Homer was born in Denver. Now, whether he had a physical disability brought on by scoliosis or suffered injuries from being dropped as a newborn baby, he was what was popularly called a humpback, or to use the more politically incorrect term, a hunchback. He never grew taller than five feet. Fate didn't deal Homer Lee a good hand in life. Aside from his physical condition, which profoundly limited the kinds of activities he could engage in and how people viewed him, also suffered from a number of chronic illnesses and conditions that dogged him his whole life. And the misery of living with all these afflictions were only made worse because of the times Homer Lee lived in. He suffered from Bright's disease, diabetes, hypertension, poor eyesight, constant migraines, and many other illnesses that came and went and left him just a little bit worse off than he had been before. He began high school in Denver, but because of the way he looked, he suffered the whole gauntlet of ridicule. Adults are mean, but kids, in their own special way, can be mean too. And Homer Lee was on the receiving end of this meanness. His father moved him to a high school in San Jose in the middle of sophomore year, and that didn't work out. The family moved to Los Angeles, to a home just south of downtown L.A., and Homer attended Los Angeles High School, oldest one in the city, still around today, and he graduated in the 1896 class. After what was probably a tortuous first two years in high school, Homer was able to finally catch a break. He really blossomed at L.A. High. He was popular. He had a gift for the gab, became a star debater, outdoorsman, always pushing himself to the limit. He even joined the fencing team and excelled in this sport. When it came time to move on after high school, Homer applied to and was accepted at the West Point Military Academy. Later, after they discovered his physical condition, they told him sorry. Now, Homer got into Harvard, but his father was low on funds and they couldn't afford the cost. So he ended up at Occidental College, located halfway between downtown L.A. and Pasadena. And it was during his time at Occidental that he reinvented himself. Homer Lee had an intense passion for the military. He was born with the spirit of a warrior, but without the physical means to live out his aspirations to lead troops on the battlefield. 
And if he couldn't fight, Homer resolved he'd at least become expert in all manifestations of military science and strategy. His study and mastery of all aspects of the great military campaigns and history of all the greats going back to Hannibal allowed him to speak and argue convincingly. He also took on a keen interest in events going on in China. Thanks to the Lee family Chinese cook, Homer knew how to speak a few words and was at least aware of Chinese culture. As a teenager, he used to frequent L.A. Chinatown for excitement. The news in 1895 of China's humiliating defeat at the hands of the Japanese drew his attention to this part of the world, and he began to intensely follow what was going on there. In 1897, he transferred to Stanford, where his interest in China grew to become an obsession. But as it was, from time to time, health issues would pop up and incapacitate Homer. That's what happened to him during his first year at Stanford, and he had to spend the rest of 1897 recuperating at home in L.A. The following year, the Spanish-American War broke out, and he wasn't happy to be a 22-year-old man forced to remain on the sidelines of the war while other young men, his age and younger, went off to fight against Spain. The outcome of that war turned America into a Pacific power after they wrote Spain a $20 $20 million check and took over the Philippines. This new dynamic was something of interest to Homer. And then came the exciting and disturbing events of 1898, when, after 103 days of reforming the Chinese government systems between June 11th and September 22nd, the Guangxi Emperor was overthrown by his auntie, the Empress Dowager Cixi, and her allies Yuan Shikai and Rong Lu. This coup d'etat did away with all this talk of reform and further entrenched the political team in the Forbidden City who were highly conservative and anti-foreign, among other things. This whole event really made Homer Lee sit up and take notice. These reformers in China, led by Kang Yo Wei and Liang Qi Chao and others, had worked hand-in-hand with the Guangxi Emperor to institute all kinds of national reforms. This was of intense interest to Homer. It was one thing to read about Napoleon and others, but here seemed to be something that was brewing in Homer's own lifetime. And this is where he began to dream that perhaps he might have a role to play. Once this period, known as the Hundred Days Reform, was finished, the Emperor's Dowager, in a political act that would perhaps more than anything else define her infamy, launched this coup d'etat, snatched her nephew, the emperor, and put him under house arrest for the remainder of his days. And hers, but we'll get to that later. And then, as it happens, someone walked into Homer Lee's life and provided the catalyst that led to everything I'm going to talk about for the next half hour. Not soon afterwards, Homer Lee met the acquaintance of Ng Pun Chu. He was a famous and respected Hoisan Chinese-American leader who had a national voice. I mentioned about him in the CHP 194 episode on the history of Hoisan immigration to the U.S. Through their church, Homer's parents met Ng Pun Chu and had him over one night. And Homer got to meet him, and this champion and fighter for Chinese civil rights became Homer's gateway to the entire L.A. Chinatown community. And once Homer returned to Stanford, Ng Pun Chu was able to open up a lot of key doors in the Bay Area Chinese community as well. There was something about Homer that, in 1900, piqued the interest of many of these leaders of the Chinese-American community on the West Coast. Was it because Homer simply knew how to talk a good game with them and fill their heads with these ideas that he was awash in all this military knowledge and expertise? Were they desperate for any Caucasians who reached out to their community, which was already eight years into Chinese exclusion and all this coast-to-coast anti-Chinese sentiment? Whatever the case may have been, it didn't take long for Homer to obtain carte blanche access to some of the movers and shakers of the L.A. and San Francisco Chinese communities. And with an introduction from someone the likes of Ng Pun Chu, that was a serious stamp of approval. And it was through these contacts that Homer Lee began to insinuate himself into the upper echelons of the Bao Huang Hui, or the Chinese Empire Reform Association. Now, this is an extreme simplification, but basically at this point, the argument in China regarding what to do with the Manchu Qing government 
came down to two points of view. One group said, get rid of these guys. And the other one said, keep them, but reform the system. The latter had had their hundred days of trying to do this, and were all now on the run, overseas, hiding from the Qing authorities who were insisting on remaining in charge. In July 1899, a bunch of like-minded individuals in Chinese communities in Canada and all over the USA banded together and formed chapters of this Bao Huang Hui Association. Their objective was to overthrow the Empress Dowager Cixi and to restore the Guangxu Emperor to his rightful place on the dragon throne. Bao Huang means to protect or look after the Emperor. After the hundred days came to an abrupt end, Kang Yo Wei had barely escaped within an inch of his life and was forced to flee. He was now leading the campaign against Cixi and was one of the main figureheads in this Bao Huang Hui. This was where Homer saw an opening for himself. Thanks to all the key doors that Ng Pun Chu had opened for him, Homer was able to lobby these Chinatown elders to put their trust in him. By this time, 1898, 1899, and especially thereafter, Homer styled himself as a wizened military expert and strategist extraordinaire, a Zhuge Liang, a Sun Tzu. To butter these guys up, Homer would even reveal to them that he was a relative of the Confederate general Robert E. Lee. This was a complete falsehood, and they didn't even spell their surname the same way. But this is what Homer told them. Hey, what the hell? How are they supposed to know? He was on a mission. And like many a Lao Wai before him, and countless others who followed, Homer grossly exaggerated his bona fides to those he rubbed elbows with in the Bao Huang Hui. He saw this Chinese Empire Reform Association as his possible ticket to ride that might put him in the saddle and perhaps even allow him to see some action in China and ride through mansions of glory. If the doors were closed to him in the U.S., he figured he'd try his luck in China. On March 16, 1900, Homer appeared at a big banquet in San Francisco Chinatown, attended by a lot of heavies, and and spoke on matters related to the Bao Huang Hui and his ideas about how to restore the emperor to power. Somehow, and who's to tell why they did this, Homer convinced these guys to hire him, pay him a monthly allowance, cover his expenses, and send him to China to go assist Kang Yo Wei's people out there in their efforts. So in June 1900, Homer sailed off into the sunset, departing San Francisco, and he made his way in the direction of Hong Kong to begin his adventure. He must have been pleased with himself. He had conned the Bao Huang Hui higher-ups to put up the chips to fund his involvement. He no doubt dreamed the entire voyage across the Pacific about how this might all play out. Prior to his exit, thanks to leaking some information to overzealous news reporters, someone wrote an article in the San Francisco Call titled, Young Californian is Plotting to Become Commander-in-Chief of Chinese Rebel Forces. From that article, and all the sizzle it created immediately afterwards... Homer Lee practically built a whole cottage industry that propagated this myth that he was this indispensable man within the Kang Yo Wei and later Sun Yat-sen organizations. And just like Morris Two-Gun Cone, he knew how to stoke the myth and supersize what was in essence not much. Once he arrived in Hong Kong, he was greeted and feted by the reform leaders there. They had to give some face to their California brothers who introduced him, so they rolled out the red carpet for Homer. So he was tasked with training troops and, more importantly, help use his connections to try and get weapons and arms. It was because Homer Lee came so highly recommended that these veteran revolutionaries in China wasted their time. Homer was able to put on a great show when he was on his home court in the United States. Those Chinese-American elders were a lot easier to hoodwink than their brothers in China. And they didn't like what they saw from the get-go. They humored him and treated Homer well. They even gave him a lieutenant general rank, which he wore proudly. Just like with Tugun, who also got an honorary generalship, plenty of people snickered when they said General Homer Lee. He could almost see the quotation marks around general in their thought bubble. He took it dead serious and always dressed to the nines in his officer's uniform that was specially designed for him. 
When Homer arrived in Hong Kong, the Boxer Rebellion was going at full throttle. And Homer thought this was perfect. Now for sure he'd get to see some action. The Empress Dowager was back on her heels thanks to the foreign intervention. And he imagined that he, Homer Lee, could actually ride with his Bao Huang Hui troops and capture Cixi and make good on the objective of restoring the Guangxu Emperor to power. He got in the middle of the planning to rescue Guangxu from his aunt's captivity. And all along, he never let up advising anyone in the Bao Huang Hui leadership who would listen to him about what moves they needed to carry out to achieve victory. Now, mind you, he hadn't even been in China for a month and was hardly in the position to teach these veterans what to do. But he acted in a way that appeared that he had this whole thing figured out. Finally, to get him out of their hair, the leaders sent Homer Lee and a couple officers on a fool's errand to go train troops in Guangdong and Guangxi. As soon as Homer got knee-deep in this assignment, he realized this was all one massive, frustrating waste of time and nothing was getting accomplished. He could speak a few words of Cantonese with the family cook, but that didn't help much in real life, trying to turn farmers into rebel soldiers. In the meantime, the Qing military was making fast work of the Bao Huang Hui rebels. Homer had become a person of interest, and the Qing authorities got wind of what he was up to. To escape possible capture, Homer decided to cut short his trip dress up in a disguise, and make his way to Shanghai. And from there, he went on to Japan, stayed a couple months, meeting Sun Yat-sen briefly. And then, after four months in Asia, and little to show for his time out there, he sailed back to San Francisco. This whole adventure hadn't worked out as hoped. As soon as he got back, there were plenty of reporters keen to chat with him. When they interviewed Homer, he spoke of the few harrowing events that he faced during his time fighting for the Bao Huang Hui. He was quite adept at inflating the details and acting coy to gin up the mystery of his secret role. He also wrote a piece for the San Francisco Call titled, How I Was Made a General in the Chinese Army. The whole matter of his departure to China, the short period he was actually there in the care of the Bao Huanghui people, and then the aftermath, recalling his exploits to the press, this all served as the foundation of the myth Homer Lee would craft about who he was. By hook or by crook, he was going to get people to look up to him. The truth was, from Kang Youwei down, they all thought Homer was just a lot of hot air. They let him inside because they thought, as a Westerner, maybe he had uses such as access to financial support and government contacts. Kang Yo Wei, in a letter to someone on July 5th, 1901, wrote, quote, Homer Lee does not understand our internal situation, and his idea is not feasible. It costs us thousands of dollars for Homer Lee, who was of no help to us. Homer Lee's words are merely like someone talking in their sleep, end quote. Earlier that year, in April, they gave Homer the boot. By the summer of 1901, he was back at home, 25 years old, living off his father, all the while still trying to keep the embers burning with the Bao Huang Hui. He started to fancy this crazy idea to set up a chain of training centers across the country that would accept Chinese-American cadets, train them with drill instructors who could be recruited, and when the time came, they could be sent to China to support the Bao Huang Hui. This whole thing was sort of like what the CIA did in March 1960, training all these Cuban exiles. This idea, training a mercenary army, kept Homer busy throughout 1903 and into 1904. In October 1903, Liang Chichao passed through L.A. on his American tour. Homer jumped right in and threw him a nice banquet and rustled up a lot of local notables and politicians in addition to Le Tu, L.A. Chinatown. He accompanied Liang throughout his visit and was most helpful with the arrangements he made. For all his efforts and the success of the visit, Homer was able to bask in the afterglow and enjoy all this recognition for his efforts. But for all the nice work he did, Liang Chi Chao kind of stabbed Homer in the back, the details of which we'll get to in a moment. Homer kept at it with his scheme of building this mercenary army. He was trying to mask this scheme as military schools and, you know, put up this whole 
facade. And after a few stumbles, Homer lucked out and found a former Army drill instructor and Spanish-American War veteran who saw action in the Philippines named Ansel O'Banion. Once he was introduced to Homer, things really took off. And O'Banion, thanks to his fellow vets and other military contacts, he was able to scale everything up nice and fast. At its peak, this organization Homer and O'Banion created had about 2,100 cadets signed up at 27 academies, coast to coast. There were plenty of Chinese-American cadets who signed up. There were also plenty of them who came from China and who were smuggled across the Mexican border and through other dubious recruitment methods. By 1905, Homer had quite an operation going. In order to get around the neutrality laws that would put the kibosh on his plans, had the truth ever become public knowledge, Homer, as I said, created a facade for his training camps, registering them as the Western Military Academy, again, attempting to cloak these training camps into something a little more innocuous. But this was one of those open secrets. Plenty of people knew what Homer was up to. And remember I told you Liang Chi Chao double-crossed Homer? Well, while he was still on the West Coast, Liang met with and ended up signing some document with a soldier of fortune and adventurer named Richard Falkenberg. Essentially, what Liang Chi Chao did was to designate Falkenberg as the commander-in-chief of the Chinese Reform Army that was being cobbled together here in America. Like Homer Lee... Falkenberg also had his own similar scheme going called the Chinese Imperial Reform Army. This was news to Homer, who thought he was that guy, and had been made that guy by no less a person than Kang Yu Wei. So this whole matter became one of those acrimonious, mud-slinging kind of rivalries that was played out regularly in The Prince. Essentially, Homer was the one who came up with this whole idea and had done all the heavy lifting. Falkenberg essentially hijacked the whole Reform Army idea. Homer didn't give up without a fight, and what ultimately happened was Homer got Kang Yo Wei to break the impasse and declare Homer the one in charge and who had his blessing. But this whole ugly mess with two guaylos vying for control of some militia that wanted to interfere in China's internal affairs ended up becoming such a spectacle, the government came along and started an investigation led by the Secret Service. Homer probably knew they knew what he was actually up to with these Western military academies. Nonetheless, he did everything he could to put on a good face and to project a positive image of his network of schools. As a PR move that indicated he had nothing to hide, Homer had even finagled an entry into the 1905 Tournament of Roses parade. O'Banion and a whole bunch of cadets marched in that annual parade held in Pasadena. That was quite a sight to see these Chinese soldiers marching down Colorado Avenue in formation, rifles at the ready. This was all great public relations for about a minute. But Homer's energy was being sapped by the constant lengths he had to go to in order to keep public scrutiny and the feds off his scent. In the meantime, Kang Yo Wei made a grand tour of America in 1905. Homer Lee made himself useful to Kang, offering him the red carpet treatment, arranging banquets, accompanying him to see political leaders, including U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. It had been 23 years into the exclusion laws and 13 years into the Gary Act. Wherever Kang went on this 1905 tour, he spoke out against these racist and offensive federal laws. Even when Kang and Homer were having their sit-down with Roosevelt on June 16, 1905, T.R. listened to Kang's words and said he'd try to do something about it. Throughout 1905, Homer's military academies and everything associated with them began to take on a very bad smell. It seemed all he ever had time to do was make statements trying to prove the legitimacy of his Western military academies. Plus, one more albatross around his neck came in the form of Richard Falkenberg. Though Homer had won out over Falkenberg as far as the leadership of this whole harebrained scheme, Falkenberg, throughout 1905, never missed an opportunity to vilify Homer, spread rumors, leak accusations, and just trip Homer Lee up wherever, whenever. It got so bad that Homer had to finally take stock of everything and shut the whole thing down. 
and 1905. That's what he did. Kang had written Homer and November, basically saying the Bao Huang Hui no longer required his services. Thank you very much for your help. Bye-bye. And they terminated the monthly allowance they had been paying Homer all this time. It was over with them. While they appreciated Homer's sincerity, all the public and government scrutiny, the whole matter of Falkenberg, they put Kung and his allies in a bad light, and they had to distance themselves from this whole wacky idea. Also, in 1905 came the shocking outcome of the Russo-Japanese War. This became Homer Lee's newest passion. Not many people back in 1905 foresaw what would happen later on in 1931, 1937, and into the 1940s. Some welcomed a new power like Japan in the Far East, but there were those who predicted nothing but trouble. Homer followed this matter closely, and this became his new cause. In January 1907, the L.A. Times wrote some puff piece on Homer that mentioned he was giving up his career in military affairs and focusing his efforts on his new writing career. And in the aftermath of the Treaty of Portsmouth that ended the Russo-Japanese War, Homer Lee began work on a book titled Valor of Ignorance. This project took up most of his waking hours. And then in the following year, in November 1908, came the suspicious deaths of the Empress Dowager and her nephew, the Guangxu Emperor, one right after the other. And with that, the whole raison d'etre of the Bao Huang Hui was immediately nullified. They ceased to exist as an organization. Homer had one more idea up his sleeve, and this pipe dream later became known as the Red Dragon Conspiracy. Late 1908, Homer started thinking, now that the Guangxu Emperor was gone, he'd move his chips over to the revolutionaries who were looking to overthrow the Qing and install a constitutional republic. Here is where Homer Lee joined up with one of the early Chinese-American heroes who achieved national fame. This was Yong Wing, the first Chinese graduate from an American university, Yale, in Yong Wing's case. He's a future CHB topic that I haven't gotten to yet, so I won't wax too eloquently on who he was in Chinese-American history. Homer collaborated with Yong Wing to solicit support from certain financial backers to raise a mercenary army that, in theory, if all went well, would go to China, topple the Qing dynasty, and install a new government. And this new government, as the sales pitch went, would be most preferential in their treatment of those early financial backers. The plan, to put it simply would be to raise money to train a mercenary army and send these fighters to southern China where they would first conquer Guangdong and Guangxi and from this southern base begin their takeover of China and facilitate the ultimate overthrow of the Manchu Qing rulers. Well, to make a long story short, the whole thing fizzled in the end due to lack of funding from interested investors. Even to the most gullible, this whole thing had failure written all over it. But the good thing, well, for Homer that is, was that Thanks to Yong Wing's intro, Homer was able to get in real good with Sun Yat-sen, who he had already briefly met once before. All throughout 1909-1910, Homer and Sun exchanged many letters. Sun Yat-sen was completely fluent in English, so he had many foreign friends and advisors. Homer was one of many. But Sun put a very great amount of trust in Homer Lee and seemed to appreciate his advice. And just as Two-Gun Cone would be many years later, Homer was totally dedicated to Sun. In late 1908, Homer Lee published his first book, a novel called The Vermilion Pencil. It was semi-autobiographical as far as the plot went, involving a certain lieutenant general in the army in China. It was a typical story commonly found in these novels of that time that could be slotted in the great white savior genre. In the fall of 1909, Valor of Ignorance was published, and this one made Homer a star. It wasn't what you'd call a bestseller by any accounts, but it was read by some very big and very influential people. And the content Homer wrote about was extremely divisive. A lot of people in 1909, with World War I and World War II still not written into the history books yet, they found the content very alarmist in nature. Essentially, Homer thought he had Japan figured out. He believed Japan 
ever since their shock victory over Russia in 1905, for many reasons, was going to stop at nothing to create a Pacific Empire that not only included conquering East and Southeast Asia, but Hawaii and the West Coast of the United States as well. It may have been his insight, or something he saw that very few others noticed, but Homer became a crusader for this cause, and this book would end up opening up a lot of doors. Late 1909, Homer was riding high in the saddle. Valor of ignorance gave him a high degree of shine, and not just in the United States. Speaking fees and honorarium started flowing in. Doors were opening everywhere. The street cred that he so strongly craved in the eyes of others because of the success of this book, was established to some degree. Nothing much had happened in Homer Lee's life. When Valor of Ignorance was published, Homer was 33 years old. All his involvement with the Bao Huang Hui, Kang You Wei's Hail Mary to restore the Guangxi Emperor, yeah, he had a few adventures, but that all led to nothing. The military academies, the Red Dragon Conspiracy people calling him general with a sarcastic laugh, and whatever else they said about him because of his physical condition. Homer had taken it all on the chin. But not now. People were sitting up and taking notice. Sun Yat-sen maybe read into this whole thing too deeply, because into 1910, he became completely taken in by Homer Lee, and the two became very close. And this is really the final chapter in Homer Lee's life, his association with Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Also in late 1909, let me mention, Homer's assistant and good friend, Ethel Powers, divorced her husband and moved in with Homer. And Ethel became integral to everything that Homer wrote or said from here on out. They later married, and she remained with him to the very end, which, in Homer Lee's case, wasn't very far off. The whole smattering of afflictions he had battled his whole life were finally starting to work in consort to grind his life down to a halt. By now, his Bright's disease was in its final stages. His kidneys were shot. He knew he wasn't going to live into old age. His eyesight, never good to begin with, was failing rapidly. He found an eye specialist in Wiesbaden and made an appointment to go see him in Germany. He and Ethel decided to tie the knot and went off on a European vacation and for Homer to receive treatment on his eyes. That summer, Homer had heard word that yet another of Sun Yat-sen's uprisings had failed to reach critical mass, and Sun was overseas scrambling for allies and financial backers. When the historic milestone moment came on October 10, 1911, in Wuchang, Sun was in Colorado on a fundraising tour. The revolutionary leaders in China all urged him to return ASAP. Sun Yat-sen decided, before he returned to China, he'd make one last attempt to rustle up some financial and political support in America and Britain. He got in touch with Homer in Europe and told him to meet him in London and to pull out all the stops to line up supporters there. By November 10th, 1911, a month after the Xinhai Revolution had been launched, Sun Yat-sen was together with Homer in London. Homer struck out, lining up loans and backing. It was the same way in the U.S. No one was writing Sun Yat-sen any big checks just yet. And as you know, this was the moment, late 1911, that Yuan Shikai emerged to become the man of the hour. He had cut a deal with Sun that allowed Sun to become the first provisional president of the new Republic of China. But if Yuan pulled through on a clean abdication of the emperor and the dismantling of the Qing dynasty... Sun Yat-sen pledged he would give up the presidency and hand it over to Yuan. After striking out in London, Sun's entourage, including Homer, headed to Paris. After four frustrating days there trying in vain to obtain backing for their cause, they made their way to Marseille, where they booked a vessel to Hong Kong. What Homer Lee and Sun Yat-sen discussed during the voyage, we don't know. As I said, Sun had many advisors, and Homer was just one of them. But they grew very close. Maybe Sun had a soft spot in his heart for Homer Lee. He had promised to make Homer his military chief of staff of the Republican Army, something that Homer immediately started blabbing about to reporters. 
And as is known to happen, word got out about Homer's involvement with Dr. Sun and the U.S. government told Homer, "Uh uh-uh, no breaking neutrality laws serving in the military of a foreign nation. Eh, Sun gave Homer an honorary generalship anyway and passed the chief of staff position to someone else. When Sun triumphantly arrived in Shanghai in December 1911, it was the same old thing with respect to Homer. No one was too keen on him, and despite his dedication to the Chinese people going back to the turn of the century. Sun's colleagues didn't trust Homer. But because the big guy had faith in Homer Lee, everyone fell into line and welcomed him. And the U.S. government, too. They had their own China policy, and they were not keen one bit about having some loose cannon like General Homer Lee being in the middle of everything and possibly mucking up their plans. By the way, when Sun was sworn in as president on January 1st, 1912, Homer was present at the ceremony, the only Caucasian, I might add. Sun's loyal allies may not have been too happy about his presence among their ranks, but Sun kept him on. What Homer Lee thought about all this, I can't say, but by all accounts, this was shaping up to be the beginning of a whole new world opening up for him. Thanks to Sun Yat-sen's patronage, He was really getting in on the ground floor. As usual, reporters speculated about who he was and what role he was playing in all this. He had already been referred to in one piece as the Helmut von Moltke of China. Von Moltke, of course, the man who is credited with creating the new and improved German military back in the late 19th century. Things were looking up for Homer. But like everything else, going back to the beginning of his China journey, despite Everything looking so promising in his life, this too wasn't meant to be. On February 11th, 1912, a day before the Qing Emperor Pu Yi abdicated, Homer suffered a massive stroke that left him in a coma for three days. Sun Yat-sen had rushed to Homer's bedside to try and comfort him and show his concern. Homer's wife, Ethel, had spent the last couple years working furiously as a personal assistant to both Homer and Dr. Sun whenever needed with letter writing and other demands. She gave it her all when it came to Homer's declining health, nursing him, and attending to his every need. But Homer Lee's star was beginning to dim. There was nothing that could be done except stabilize his condition and sail back to the West Coast and seek medical attention in the U.S., They returned to America in April 1912, arriving the following month. Homer was partially paralyzed, blind, suffering from other conditions that ensured his final months or days wouldn't be comfortable or restful. Ethel and Homer rented a home in Santa Monica in Ocean Park, down the street from where I used to live back in the 1980s. In June of that year, Homer's next book was published, Day of the Saxon. This one eh, didn't do as well as Valor of Ignorance. The book focused on the inevitable fall of the British Empire and the hit that the Anglo-Saxon race was going to take from its demise. Homer then had another stroke and died five days later on November 1st, 1912, just short of his 36th birthday. Sun Yat-sen had written about Homer in the China press five days after he died, quote, Mr. Lee was physically deformed, but he possessed a wonderful brain. Although not a military man, he was a great military philosopher. He was a thoroughly sincere man and devoted his whole energy to the Chinese Revolution. End quote. The father of modern China was loyal, good, and decent to Homer Lee to the very end. I forgot to mention, all the royalties from the Japanese translated edition of Valor of Ignorance were pledged to Sun Yat-sen. As things turned out, Homer's book was wildly popular in Japan and no doubt was rogues gallery of future war criminals there. Over 84,000 copies were sold in Japan. Mpun Chu was less complimentary than Dr. Sun when he wrote about Homer later, saying, quote, Lee was never a general in the Reform Army, and there was no such army. He never commanded a Chinese regiment. He never saw a Chinese soldier in China. All the titles he wore were created by himself. The Chinese revolutionaries in China never heard of General Homer Lee. He was a schemer, pure and simple. The Chinese here in San Francisco 
regretted very much that they parted with their money, sending Lee to China in 1900. End quote. Homer Lee, over the course of his short life, managed to accumulate quite a few detractors, enemies. Those who found him distasteful were no doubt happy to read as more people than Ng Pun Chu took their turn to offer up their two cents on the life of Homer Lee. After his death, his widow Ethel destroyed most, but not all of his papers, documents, and mementos. Right after Homer passed, Ethel and her kids had to search for more economical digs. Whether the destruction of his files was done to cover up some of the more unsavory aspects of Homer Lee's life, or whether Ethel had to move fast and there was simply no place to store them, how could she or anyone have known at that moment how much interest there would be later on about her late husband? Ethel passed away in 1934. Much later on, her family took care of the arrangements to have Ethel and Homer's ashes interred in Taiwan. In 1969, there was a solemn ceremony to inter their ashes in Yangmin Shan No. 1 Cemetery in Taipei. And it was attended by a number of high-up government officials, including Sun Fo, son of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And you could go visit that gravesite today. Nobody knew it then in 1912, but Homer would later get to come out and take a posthumous bow on the world stage. After Pearl Harbor happened, and after the Empire of Japan was in control of most of Southeast Asia, people pulled their copies of Valor of Ignorance off the shelf and saw Homer Lee had predicted this whole thing. Perhaps his book inspired the Japanese military. He was only off by five days as far as when he said Manila would fall. He said the Japanese would take it in three weeks, but it took them 26 days. He was so close in how he predicted the whole Japanese war machine would carry out their dreams of empire and the greater Asian co-prosperity sphere. Homer was shushed and called an alarmist when he proclaimed Japan was a future menace and Uncle Sam should keep a gimlet eye on them and stand ready. He railed against American complacency and for not taking this threat seriously. And for this reason, after Pearl Harbor, a lot of people pointed to Homer and admitted they should have listened to him. Claire Booth Luce, one of the leading conservative figures of the 20th century, lionized him as a soldier of democracy. In a foreword to a new edition of Valor of Ignorance, she too dredged up all the old myths and half-truths regarding Homer's life and career, and gave them new life and credibility. I mean, being held up as a genius by someone as honorable and esteemed as Claire Booth helped blow enough wind into the sails of Homer's myths to keep interest in his life alive for years to come. He was a polarizing figure, that's for sure. Geopolitical hawks, nationalists, admirers of racial purity, social Darwinism, and the continued dominance of the Anglo-Saxon people. This resonated with a whole lot of people who found merit in what Homer Lee wrote about, particularly in Valor of Ignorance and the Day of the Saxon. But pacifists, isolationists, and those who, in general, would prefer to give peace a chance, they found Homer to be nothing except a warmonger of the worst sort. Interest, though, there may be about him... Homer Lee is a mostly forgotten cult figure from this period in China. Who can know what the veracity is of all the things that have been said and written about him? We know for sure he had a lot of face time with Kang Yo Wei and Liang Qi Chao during the whole Bao Huang Hui period. He also got to spend a great deal of time with Sun Yat-sen. What useful things did Homer say to the father of modern China, if any? We don't know. If you'd like to learn more about Homer Lee or read up on more details about some of the things I've mentioned, you're in luck. If you Google Homer Lee, you'll find there are a lot of articles, books, academic papers, and videos that chronicle his life. May I particularly recommend the one and only recent monograph on Homer Lee's life. This came out not too long ago in 2010 from the University Press of Kentucky. It's by Dr. Lawrence M. Kaplan. And the book is entitled, Homer Lee, American Soldier of Fortune. I strongly recommend this book to anyone interested to learn more. Link at the show notes, of course. Well, well, we ran a little long. I didn't want to break this one up into two. So you got more for your money than usual. 
And just as Homer Lee used to do for Sun Yat-sen, I cordially invite each and every one of you to consider a donation to my humble cause. It's easy to do. Just go to my website at teacup.media, hit the support button. There's all kinds of ways for you to help me in my quest. My deepest thanks in advance. Okay, Laszlo Montgomery here. You know where I'm signing off from. Same city and state as last time, and the time before that. I thank you once again for listening. Do consider coming back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.